Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. So today's cocktail is not necessarily a surprise. Ugh. Our listeners might recall that we went through a very arduous <laughs> process <laughs> to choose the drinks that we were going to have at Thanksgiving. That's true. Okay, so... It was arduous. It was, it was. I mean, sweat producing. <laughs> it really Like, was. I cried for hours when it was over from relief. <laughs> from relief. Okay, so maybe not. But anyway, go ahead. Now, the cocktail that we had pre-dinner, something I found on Difford's Guide called Gennaro's Sidecar. Okay. So a sidecar is traditionally cognac based with lemon this yep. one was as well but mm-hmm. it had a few little tweaks okay so i have tweaked it even further okay because i know that you are less fond of sweet cocktails <laughs> that would be true and perhaps i am i doctored this up just a little now it's it's still not going to be anything less than like you know sweet yeah but it's not going to be like oh wow this is really sweet <laughs> okay so maybe try it and see what you think so this is stokes sidecar is what i'm hearing yeah. okay yeah. okay I like that better. It's got some herb or something in it? It's got Benedictine in it. Okay. It also has uh, Angostura aromatic bitters. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I like that. So I like kick- that. It is It is still a little on the sweet side for me. Not bad. It is. But the balance is good. And I like the herb. Oh, and I also traded out a uh, triple sec for Grand Marnier. That makes sense. Because it doesn't have that sugar mm-hmm. kind of feel to it. I thought that it. might yeah, give it I like a it. slightly richer uh-huh. flavor since yeah. Grand Marnier is brandy based. Yeah. I think you'll have to make another one for me to be sure <laughs> I'd be that I happy like to it. do that. Okay. All right. Okay. Because it is arduous. Yeah. It is. It, it is. is. It is. It is. So today we're talking about power, aren't we? Power. Yes. Yeah. So I've written a lot about this, spoken a lot about this. I truly believe that our desire for an impulse toward power over other people, ourselves, situations, is the foundational aspect of the Ten Commandments version of sin. Wow. Yeah, you know, I hadn't really thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. So if we think about, just going on to the human stuff. So the first four are about loving God. Mm -hmm. The last six are about loving your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you think about the last six, they all have to do with controlling your neighbor's behavior or their lives in some way. Right. Committing adultery is about controlling your neighbor's behavior in one way or another. It's Mm -hmm. about disregarding your marital relationship, which Mm -hmm. is about having a particular kind of power. Yes. Right? Right. Killing someone is obvious, right? That's power over them, and so forth and so on. When you covet something, when when you envy something, someone has enough to want to get it, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's what coveting is. Mm -hmm. What you want is control over their thing. Right, and thereby controlling them as well. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. So that desire for power over is the foundation for at least the second set of Ten Commandments sins. I could probably convincingly argue the first four, but it doesn't matter Mm -hmm. as much, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And the reason this matters is because if we go about dealing with sin as if it's about the food, the woman, the, the desire piece, mm-hmm. we will never get it right. It's also the reason that a lot of the just say no kinds of campaigns mm-hmm. or what, what were they called? What are the virginity campaigns called? Oh, the true love weights. Yeah, true love weights and purity and all those things. Right. The problem with them is as soon as you tell somebody no, you, you build a desire for them to have power over the situation. Uh, right. Because it seems like temptation is sweeter. Yes. When you are told not to do it. When something is absolutely Mm -hmm. off limits, you want it that much more. Mm -hmm. Especially when you're a kid and you're exploring who you are and where you fit. That's right. That's right. Now, that doesn't mean that the only things we are tempted by are things we would want to have power over. Right. For example, if there are salty things in my cabinet, Mm -hmm. those are far more tempting to me than the sweet things next to them. Hmm. I have a temptation towards salt. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Yes, you could say I'm salty. Yes, <laughs> I, I could see it in your face, and you weren't going to spit it out. So Was not going to say that. See, and you could have, <laughs> but but there's something about my biology or my training or something that tends me to be tempted more by this than by that. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That isn't about the power per se. It's an added piece to it. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So when you get that, that really tricky balance of temptation and power over, desire for power, that's when you're really in trouble for self-control, for seeing the other as Christ, for any of the things that cause you to respect the other person or other people as you would yourself. Wow. Yeah. This reminds me, in some of our coursework, we talk about subjects and objects. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is reminding me of. Yep. It's like a balance of power or a shift in power that happens, for instance, in sex, mm -hmm. when one person views the other person as an object. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or really like whenever you see your status is more important than someone else, mm -hmm. someone is there to serve you. Mm -hmm. You don't see them as a person. You see them as whatever the services they provide. Right. So at that point, that person is objectified. Yep. They're an object and you exert power over that person. Yep. Even whether they experience it that way or not. Correct. Because it's what's going on in your own head you. and heart. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. And all relationships of any kind between ourselves and anything or person, including God, requires a... I take that back. Our relationship with things doesn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. Because we sort of define things as that over which we have power. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the reasons that seeing a human being as a thing automatically is a problem. Gotcha. Okay. So I realize we're kind of leaning into philosophy here. But in relationships between people, in healthy ones, there is a flow of power. Mm, right, right, right. And when that flow gets stuck, that's when you see things like um, passive aggression, going around mm, the person to get mm -hmm, things done, mm -hmm, wheedling, you know, whatever the mm -hmm. thing is. Because if you can't directly exchange power in that way, then... You find ways to do it, period. Yeah. So it's, it's really dangerous. And it is absolutely crucial that when we're engaged in relationship with anybody, and this includes the person getting on the bus before you, mm -hmm. that you really understand that that person has autonomy, that person yeah. is valuable, and so forth. So you don't simply desire power over the situation or power over them. Yeah, I mean, as as you're talking, I'm thinking about all the ways, like when you're on the freeway, mm -hmm. and and some of this comes down to kingdoms, which is another thing that we talk about quite yep. a lot, where you know, kingdom is is what you have some sense of control over. Correct. And when I'm driving, I have some sense of control over what's happening in my car. Yep. From how I'm driving, the the lane that I choose to be in, what I'm listening to on the radio or whatever, mm -hmm. I have control over these things. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have the misconception that because we have control over what's going on in the car, we also have control on everything that's happening in this lane. <laughs> or should. Or on the entire road. Yep. Right. And so at that point, that's why you know road rage can become such a problem for people because it's a power trip. Yes. We've talked also about the, the role of your will, your chooser yes. in, in things. And the key to all of this is that our wills do not like to be foiled. Mm -hmm. Once we choose something, or once we unconsciously choose something, we don't like to get stopped. Yes. We like to just continue that until it's over, mm -hmm. done, whatever. That's part of the, the problem with actual biological obsession, is mm -hmm. that there's a desire for completion that automatically goes oh, with it, right? right which can't be healed. Anyway, not can't be finished is a better word. So if I am driving down the road and somebody cuts me off, my will has been foiled yeah. because my forward progression in the way I would like to do it has now been stopped. Yes. My immediate response is to want to have power over that person mm -hmm. or power over my situation. So I change lanes. I honk. I flip the person off. I don't do that. But you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I, I react in some way mm -hmm. that allows me to see myself as over the other person or to have gotten revenge on the other person. It's right. all about power. So some time ago, um, mid 
2010s, mm-hmm. I wrote a blog piece about this lust that I suddenly felt, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's meant to be a little silly mm-hmm. because I was attracted to something I'm not generally attracted to and right. I felt it strongly. Yeah. And then had to kind of go, wait, whoa, what was that? Mm-hmm. You know? And it was really about wanting to feel powerful, be attractive, to be able to convince the person to do what I wanted them to yes. do, you know, right. all of those things, all right? Those things. And so lust, for example, often has that character, probably always has that characteristic mm-hmm. in it. Now, mm-hmm. attraction in itself doesn't necessarily have power in it, right? Right. If I had noticed this person said, wow, and then gone about my day, mm-hmm. that would have been fine, mm-hmm. right? It's once I started feeling like I wished I could do something about it or yeah. I li- let my mind linger on it, yeah. that's when the power part came in. Yeah. So one of the keys to breaking bad habits and creating good habits is to change what you have your power over. Okay. Right? So when you are trying to break a habit um, or or trying to just do something better. I'll go back to my salt addiction. Mm-hmm. Let's say that your habit is um, sitting down with a bowl of popcorn every night. Mm-hmm. Okay? And it's not good for you. You're not eating salad, all of those other things. The way that you, you slowly change mm-hmm. that habit mm-hmm. is by both resisting the popcorn, putting in something in its place, and rewarding yourself for having put it in its place. Oh, okay. So you have to have both, Okay. right? If you are trying to take up jogging, mm-hmm. right? Jogging's hard. You reward yourself in some way that supports the jogging. Yeah. That's the idea, and that's the way you break it, and that's the way you move that desire for control over to something good for you, over to something good for the world. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? That makes sense, yeah. All of that to say, and the reason we're talking <laughs> about this is I think we we try to get at sin. No, we try to get at sins, mm-hmm. and we try to get at changing ourselves, exercising discipline in all the wrong ways. Yeah. Because our wills are, are, are just way too weak. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You know, and our minds are way too strong. Yeah. And so you have to find a way to transform your mind to change mm-hmm. your mind mm-hmm. and to get your will just focused elsewhere yeah it's almost like you have to create a shiny thing over here for your will to pay attention yes. to. yes yeah 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 exactly exactly that's part of what i've been thinking about and what i really want our listeners to have hold of mm-hmm. is that when they feel like something is a sin to look at a what it is they're really talking about but B, to try and get down to what the basis for that is. Yeah. Right? Not so much the activity itself, mm-hmm. but why do I want to do that? What is the pull for me? Right. It's like with purity culture. Mm-hmm. You know, just telling teenagers not to have sex isn't really going to get at why they want to have sex, uh-huh. why they feel driven to have sex. Mm-hmm. It's not going to get it get at any of the things that actually matter about mm-hmm. why sex is something that you could choose to wait to do Mm -hmm. because it's better for you for Mm -hmm. your mental health your emotional health or whatever person and And the other person or all all those those things all the things right yeah but just by saying you shouldn't do that or god says not to do that or the bible says don't do that that is not a compelling reason for a teenager not to do something now they may face the wrath of the you know their parents or in Mm -hmm. my case my aunt Frances. (laughs) um but that's that's not enough of a reason People need to understand, teenagers and all of us need to understand what the, sure, whatever the negative ramifications are, but then understand that there's this other path that you could choose Mm -hmm. and that there there are positives and benefits to that other path. Yes. One of the ways that you can appeal to our desire for control in a situation like that Mm -hmm. is to aim all your conversations not just this one. If it's only about this one, it doesn't, it doesn't help. Mm-hmm. But aim all your conversations about having mastery over yourself. Mm, yeah. Being able to deal with your own passions, your own failures, your own successes, but being able to manage all of those well, right? Mm-hmm. Because then the desire is for control over yourself rather than control over another person. Yeah. You've got something to fight the temptation with. Right. Right. It's like it becomes a point of pride rather than a point of power Mm -hmm. to be able to say either yes or no, whatever you say, right? 
Another thing that can work in these kinds of situations when, when you're creating a culture and a family's a culture, a relationship is a culture, is to think in terms of how we together mm -hmm. behave, what it means to be part of this family. Mm -hmm. Well, as this family, we don't do that. We do do this. Yeah. It's perfectly fine for other families to do something different. But this is who we are. That by itself does not work and it can cause its own problems, but it gives a different movement to that desire for control, a right. different movement towards what your will is inclined to do. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all of those things. Right. If it is a sin to not go to church on Sunday. Now, did I, I'm not saying, that, notice the conditional in there. Mm -hmm. But if it's a sin to not go to church on Sunday and you don't really want to go to church, but you reward yourself with brunch... Mm -hmm. that's part of what you're doing. That's part, yeah, it's sort of retraining. That's right. It's sort of retraining. Now, that unfortunately doesn't take care of your desire not to go to church necessarily. It helps you build the habit of going. And over time, you yeah. might start to understand what mm -hmm. the benefits are. Exactly. You might start to feel better about going to church right. and you might actually start to like it. You might make friends. You might get involved. You might, who knows? All those things. All those Who things. knows? And that's the advantage to doing something that's good for us, right? Is that if it's actually good for us, and again, I'm not saying anything particular about church, but if it's actually good for us and we are basically healthy people, mm -hmm. we find the benefit in it. Yeah. We begin to appreciate the, the good we are getting. Right. So it becomes a different set of circumstances for us to deal with. Yeah. That Does that all make sense? Yeah, it okay. makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. So it's really about power. I just, I just wanted to make sure that we talked about that. I think it's a really important thing to talk about. Listeners, what do you think? What do you think about power? When have you felt powerful? When have you felt powerless? Those are things to think about too. Mm -hmm. We all have some personal power. Mm -hmm. Even a baby has a personal power yes. because a baby can squall and people will do, everybody <laughs> yes. will do whatever they need to do to get it to stop squalling. Yep. So everybody has some degree of power. Mm -hmm. um, some of us have more, some of us have less. And then there's the issue of privilege, which is probably another episode. That's right. Well, the problem with privilege or with an unnoticed amount of privilege mm -hmm. is that you don't experience people as having the same value as you do. You may not think that they mm -hmm. don't have the same value, but because you're so used to getting the thing you want, you don't see what's happening around you. And right. so those people wind up being more shadowy yeah. than you are. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Listeners, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Cocktailtheology.com is where we are. We are also always on the hunt for new <laughs> things to talk about. So please do drop us a line. We would love to hear from you. Until next week, I'm going to enjoy the rest of this there, You don't have much in, left well, in your glass. I know. That's sad. I know. You must have done most of the talking. <laughs> Well, this time I did. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I had the power today. Yeah. My microphone, my conversation. That's <laughs> yeah, totally fine with me. Thanks, listeners. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.